my bandwidth. I sound Oof, yeah. so wonky. Um, you're, yeah, you're a little distant. Yeah, you're a little distant and a little fuzzy. I would say. Can you just give me five, five minutes. I'm gonna give it. Give me five minutes. I'm gonna go reset my router. Okay, and um, unblur your background. That can help too. Alert, do you want yeah, to? I'll um... be right back. Okay. All right, Travis. Do you want to look at this agenda and add to it? Because I really did like throw that shiz together. I started writing. What, what, I I added a couple things here. Yeah, the Grumman reveal was huge. The voodoo ring thing, the what thing the that, drew, that the thing that drew Lee to him is that was his mother's that he hadn't seen in forty years. Did he say forty years? I believe so. That that also dates his age a little bit. We I was I still was never not really sure about Lee's age. So that maybe I'll just put that here. Yeah. Put Lee's age. That might be fun to talk about. Um. Oh, and the fact too, I didn't think about it, but under John Parry, that he, his demon just shows up. He gets a demon. What the heck? When he's in the world, yeah. Yeah, that. that's fascinating. We all wait. I'm going to say, you get a demon. <laughs> she gets a demon, and yeah. you get a demon. <laughs> and okay, perfect. Uh, in this world, in life. Yeah, Lyra's. that was so crazy. Okay. Um, okay. While, uh, yeah, okay. Will Lyra Serafina. Was Mary the second part or the third part? She was the th She's third part. The third part. part. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because she, wa she walks through the tent. She goes into the tent at the very yep. end. So, kid mob, kill, kill, kill. Right. You know what I liked so is funny. when they dispersed that Pullman describes them as like, they they like left with their shame like they were almost oh. embarrassed in a way of what they had done i really right. like that seraphina to the rescue oh they lost a witch oh that's right they did the lose specters. a witch we, yes. she said we already lost a witch to the specters yeah and i remember um, reading it the first time thinking because last time we talked i thought oh maybe they have a way to like whatever but they totally don't Equals no, no, no. Um, <laughs> are you seeing me working here? I am. Okay. I love it. Uh, because Seraphine is like, "What's up? There, there, there's a hundred around you, and they're they're like not approaching you. What is going on?" Uh, and then this, you know, what's interesting is the cave. Um, healing, wills. Oh, let me actually add that later. Cave meal. And then, which is, oops, heal, will, and with a spell that they need to work on. Yeah, it's like a, it's like a good mole. Like it takes like a day she, well, to make she it. She gives him, yeah, she gives, exactly. She gives, yeah, it's like <laughs> Sunday sauce, but like you make it on Saturday. Right. It's you, so she says, she gives him some drink. But she says, that ain't going to cut it with this right. thing. No pun intended. And then the healing spell that they're going to have to work on. That was interesting. Mm -hmm. Mary Malone, doc you know what? Fuck Dr. Payne. What the hell, man? I, this is when I want to swear on this thing. This dude picks up that card the second she walks out the room. I it's know like, it. you know what? And he's, so riding her, he's riding her coattails. And he yep. makes it so apparent that she, he is riding her coattails. Because it was almost like, what was the what was the point of saying, I got this other, like, he was like, I have this other job. I'm done. I'm going. Yeah. And at the very first hint of maybe not, like, he is all turned coat. He's a turned coat. What'd you say about me? <laughs> what, what'd you call me? Huh? <laughs> Olivia. <sighs> oh, I, I like her uh, ID making skills. Oh, my gosh. That is the... I'm trying to think of where it's I've some, seen like, like that kind of, yeah, like it was so fumbling and like, you know, I picture the fugitive, you know, when like Dr. Um, uh, Richard Kimball is like making IDs and like Tommy Lee Jones sees right through it. He's like, oh, he's making IDs. Anyway, <laughs> see, I'm thinking of when they like 
make their ID and the, and the person looks at it for a really long time and the music's like, yeah, and you're like, they're, they're going to catch him. And then he's like, you can go. He's like, move along. It's like, McLovin. Yeah. Okay, these yeah, go ahead. The, these are not the droids you're looking it's for. It's very like, much a, well, you know, and the, and the, the cave told her that you just have to, you know, deceive this one person, be the serpent, right? Ooh, be the serpent. That was so good. I know. It's and also great. so symbolic of like, I don't know. Serpents. <laughs> yes, religion. You but know, is she supposed Adam to be the serpent to Will and Lyra? Um, I was thinking serpent to be deceptive. But oh, another yeah. thing is, uh, it says, okay, it has to play a serpent, deceive. It tells her um, the serpents won't, the, uh, the specters will leave you alone. Yeah. It's I don't understand that. Yeah. How do like they have she a doesn't even know what it is. But like yeah. yeah, how do they know? But the is fact it because that they she have doesn't have a demon? Kind of... But she she does. But she does. But yeah, she would. She does. I feel it's like because they have some kind of like cosmic control because they're like literally the particles of like everything. That maybe they have some kind of power. Yeah. I don't know. Well, oh, much to discuss. Much, to, and we'll try to keep it. We'll try to. Yeah. It's a good thing we've got a podcast to talk all about about all this stuff. You're we a little hot. Done. You're a little hot, Travis. You're a little hot, Travis. Am I? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I would say back oh, back sorry. off back off the microphone quite a bit. Well, my microphone's all the way over here. Try okay. Talk a little bit. That? Bring it in a little bit. Hello. Put it back again. Bring it back in. I feel <laughs> I'll just, like I'll just mess with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that's that's a pretty good. That's a pretty okay. Good. Uh, cool. All right. So and you you look and sound a lot better, Travis. Awesome. Uh, Joanna, do you want to uh, blur your background? Uh, yes. If I ever, can you remind me how to do that? There's three. Oh, little I see dots. it. I see it. I did yeah. it. I did it. I totally did it. Okay. Hey. Okay. Ooh. Stuff connected. Just you know, I've spent all day listening to you guys and watching you guys because oh, all the oh. editing. <laughs> I'm, so so, I'm so sorry. Um, yeah, no, I've been uh, tweaking videos uh, for YouTube. So yeah, it's um, it I, seeing you live now is really weird. <laughs> How do we turn the handsomeness factor down on this a little bit? <laughs> Crank it down. Can you see my cat? multiple times trying to in the knock background. over something. Oh yeah, I see it every time. She nudges, she nudges, she wants me to pet her so she headbutts the thing and I'm like, oh my god, it's like she's going to knock it over. One know. day she's going to, sorry. My cats seem to always sleep during this, knock on wood. She always sleep, they always sleep during the podcast, so prayers lifted. Your, your soothing voice. Okay, are you ready? Yes. yes. Hello and welcome to the Amber Spycast, your one-stop shop for all things His Dark Materials. Your Dark Materialists are myself, Joanna, and Travis. We're tearing through the subtle knife. Only one more week after this, and then we then we get the series, which we're so excited about. Joanna, you want to dive us into chapters 10, 11, and 12? On it. So in Lyra's world, Lee Scoresby continues to search for Stanislaus Grumman. He packs up his balloon and makes his way by boat down the Yenisei River. After docking in a village, he enlists the help of an old Siberian Tartar, who tells Lee that they have been expecting him. Lee follows the old man to a wood-framed, skin-covered hut where Grumman, who is now a shaman, lives. A bright yellow-eyed demon watches Lee from behind splays of dried flowers and pine. The old man calls for Grumman in his native tongue, using a different name, Japari. Lee tells Grumman about Lyra and Lord Azriel and asks for his help. Grumman reveals that his real name is John Perry and that he brought Lee here using a Navajo ring that belonged to Lee's mother. Perry says that Lord Azriel's task is the greatest undertaking in human history and that he needs something he doesn't have to succeed, a subtle knife. He wants Lee to take him to find the instrument and the knife bearer who wields it. Lee agrees to take John Perry to the other world to look for the knife if he agrees to pay, place Lyra under its protection once he has it. 
In Chigaze, Will and Lyra are attacked and almost killed by a group of angry children. But Serafina Pekula and her clan rescue them and take them away from the city. Serafina notices that specters seem to be afraid of Will's knife. When they are settled, Serafina looks at Will's wound and prepares a spell to help heal his hand. As Will sleeps, Serafina asks Lyra to tell her about the boy. Back in Will's world, Mary Malone tries to convince her colleague, Dr. Oliver Payne, to continue their work with the shadows. Dr. Payne is ready to quit when Sir Charles Latram walks through the door and offers them funding to continue their research. His only condition is that they allow him to determine the course of their studies. Mary refuses, angering Sir Charles. Later that evening, Mary returns to the lab and is able to talk to the shadows through the use of her computer. The shadows tell Mary that her fate is somehow connected with that of Will and Lyra. They tell her to leave her world and enter another where she will be protected from the specters. After destroying the computer and the remains of her work, Mary deceives the watchman guarding the window and enters the warm, sunny world of Chigazi. So guys, I just wanted to uh, rewind a little bit towards earlier in the week when we were uh, on our little text message chain and we were all getting into chapter 10 with the big reveal and uh and travis you posted a picture of yourself with the uh the googly eyes and the rea the big reaction and the, i i sort of had the same reaction with uh the reveal that grumman is will perry john yes. perry oh john sorry john will not will john perry i i, I yelped yeah, like yeah. out loud yelped and my husband and my daughter were like what's the matter and I was like oh my god like I was I couldn't believe it it's it, I, I don't remember this book I forgot all. it I forgot I that totally completely do not. I remembered the golden compass no problem but this book it was a total shock to me and it was awesome it was the best thing because I did not remember it yeah I was in um DC suburban traffic and I don't know how familiar you guys are with it but it's awful and <laughs> I saw the I, I well I'm, I'm doing the audiobook. I didn't see anything because that would be uh, very in your um, mind's eye irresponsible. <laughs> so yeah, my audible's going and it's like you know I'm I'm Will John Perry. What what? And then I took a picture of myself and sent it to the crew because it was just amazing. What a great moment! Terrific moment. And you know, Lee's Lee's continuing to have these terrific little vignette adventures that just draws more into his his sort of way and uh, learning more about him and Hester. I just love Hester. Uh, how much is it, he's so sort of game and willing to go on an adventure. You know, they they even mentioned that his gold is dwindling. You know, he, he's he's committed to this task. You know, he really mm -hmm. is. Uh, and there's there's a few moments in his adventure early on um, you know, the the Magisterium's military is moving north, right? And this is a big piece that it makes things feel a little more urgent. I think Lee feels the urgency when he notices that the military is sort of like buying up um, all transportation and everything they can get their hands on uh, in order to sort of move north and I guess maybe pass through this this gate that has been opened. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's a, there's a kind of a tremendous moment where... Lee essentially uses his the ring that he picked off the dead. You know, of course, we did. We had a, an assumption that he was taking this ring for a reason. Oh, this could be valuable, and, and sure enough, it's very valuable. He he purports to be a member of the Magisterium, and he's able to take his balloon back, which was already commandeered by the military or the religious military or whatever this group is, and he's able to get his balloon back, fill it. And departs, uh, but when he's departing, there's a, a moment that sort of took my breath away, which is when the one, the one man that's holding the rope to keep him from leaving on the balloon refuses to let go of the rope and is lifted off the ground. Mm -hmm. But his demon is a ground-based demon. Were you guys just as kind of like heart in your throat, kind of in that moment? Oh yeah, I mean, it was just like, why aren't you letting go? Just let go, let go, like, let yeah. Go. Why and did he not let go? Yeah, and then they said that, and this was so weird. They said sometimes that happened. Like Lee, Lee, when he's talking, says, you know, sometimes that happens. Sometimes they just they don't let go. Like there's a split kind of second decision where they have to, and they don't, and they miss their like chance. 
Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, it was awful. I was just like, oh, God, like, do you let go and you drop to your death? I guess either way, they would have died. It was horrible. Yeah. He's, you know, he, this it, it feels a little bit like, you know, Heart of Darkness, you know, there's sort of like heading up the river and, you know, finding his way to this, you know, strange village with a, a strange shaman leader that's uh, uh, unusual and, 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 you know, this Grumman character is, is a mystery in many ways. But his journey upstream or upriver um, is brief in the book for the most part. He gets there without much incident. The rivers are swollen because of the melting ice. Um, there are things that used to be passable because they used to be ice covered and now it's just water and makes them more treacherous. But he does get to this village. It's remote, somewhat remote. And his entrance into this village I found to be sort of like that, like coming into such a, a foreign group of people. And and we learn, I learned that Lee seems to speak, oh, I don't know, 20 languages. What was that? <laughs> they went through how many? It's like they went through, yeah, 20 different languages before they found <laughs> one they could both speak. What? It's great. He is full of surprises, that he man. He really is. Is Lee a little bit of a Mary Sue? <laughs> no. You take no. that back. No. I'm you thinking take Lee's a little too perfect. <laughs> no. He can definitely fly the Millennium Falcon without any problems. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Oh, my gosh. I just realized that his demon is Chewbacca. Oh, yeah. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. Hester is, <laughs> is uh, of very few words. Yes. She only, and Lee, I like Lee says, you know, I guess in his voice that, uh, you know, she only speaks when, when it's absolutely necessary. I love that. Mm-hmm. I love that. Cause it, what it said was that he was used to her silence and, and her to his. And I just thought that was so cool. You know, they spoke when they needed to. It was just, it was just having that, that total comfort and knowledge of each other where they could, you know, they could be alone together and it was, it was fine. Isn't mm-hmm. sharing silence the most intimate way of being together with someone is like you don't feel the need to fill negative space with sound, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I, I have a friend who is sort of, you know, working his way through things. And that's the one thing he misses is having someone just to share silence with. And that's a great kind of, you know, that's the relationship that they have. It's wonderful. And then you take that to another level when you realize that she's a part of him and yeah. that he, it's almost meditative. He can sit there in silence with himself. And that I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. She has her space on the balloon, you know, where she, mm-hmm. and even on the, on the, on the bow of the boat, you know, she sort of goes into her little space and, and looks out over the water, looks up over the air and is just mm-hmm. taking it in quietly by herself. You know, very close to Lee, you know, they can't be that far apart, mm-hmm. uh, but just sort of enjoying the, the majesty of whatever she's looking at. I just love that. She's great. Yep. And you know, we, um, you, I, the, the Instagram feed, we posted a picture of, of uh, Lee and, uh, and Hester from sort of a, a production still or, or a, 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 you know, a, a promotional, professional, photo. Yeah, a promotional mm-hmm. photo of, of Lynn with Hester. And I just thought, you know, it gave me goosebumps. I'm pretty mm-hmm. excited. He, solid mustache, too. Shout out to the mustache. I was thinking he was more of a goatee, but now I've noticed that he grew more of a full mustache and just a little patchwork on the chin. Yeah. Not so not like not a full time. Van Dyke, not a full Van Dyke there. <laughs> no, no, just no, the no. mustache with the soul patch or something. He- no, it's heavy on the top. No, yeah, it's it, there's no Greg Allman thing here. <laughs> okay. Like it, it's pretty good. I just dated myself. He really did. <laughs> all right. So um, with all these languages, they, they finally get to communicate, and then he is taken to meet Grumman mm-hmm. in his sort of beautiful and, and unusual living space. Um, and he's frail and fragile and seems to be, I guess, is he ill? Do you think? Well, yeah, we find out he's got uh, heart disease. That's right. His heart is ill. He, he yeah. has maybe one thing, one thing left to do before his heart gives out. Mm-hmm. And this is it. But I, what interested me was when he said that he has, uh, his heart is ill in a way that uh, can't be cured on this world. And I wondered if back on an hour world it could be it was something that was easily fixed yeah what like a like a blood thinner would solve it on our, right. in our world you know something simple like that 
Mm-hmm. And he's been, you know, he accidentally ended up in this world. You know, mm-hmm. Lyra's world was, it was an accident. They sort of got caught in a blizzard, you know, and, and ended up passing through a, a, a gateway into this world. And he's been stuck here for 12 years. Hey, when that happens. Yeah. The, um, you know, in the audiobook now, I wanted, wanted to get your perspective on this one. Um, he sounded very old. The actor who portrayed him sounded very old. And I wondered, you know, based on just reading the book, what age do you think he was? Well, John Perry, I guess, or, you know, Grumman slash John Perry. Um, I guess if I'm thinking about him as Will's father, and I have been mm-hmm. now, like sort of was a, yeah, I guess when you're talking about him in the abstract, I did maybe think of him as much older. Right. But now that he's a little, there's, there's, he's, there's a more identifiable timeline of his life. Mm-hmm. And we know how old Will is. And I know, you know, men can be old, very, very old. Right. But he was an adventurer, an explorer. I kind of peg him as 50. Okay. You know, in that range, maybe. That's an, it's still an older father for someone with a 13-year-old. Right. Um, or or eleven year old. I guess that I, I don't know. Where where do you come down, Joanna? I mean, I, I think I think you're right. I think it was before before I fully knew that he was John Perry. I felt like he was maybe a little older, but I didn't think of him as much older than than Azrael. Like I just yeah. thought of him as just like, you know, he was still young enough to be out and about and and relevant and like, you know, adventurous and rugged. Um, but have had experience. And so he was up, you know, a little bit a little bit higher. But um when I found out it was his father, I just kind of, I just pulled it, I dialed it back a little bit. Like he's in his mm-hmm. like mid to late forties. Yeah. Yeah. I'm kind of with that. Like, you know, Michael Douglas circa romancing the stone or something. Yeah. Maybe a little <laughs> old, maybe a little older than that, but yeah, something like yeah. that. Well, little, little just Joan action. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about, uh, Grumman slash, Perry and the ring which drew Lee to him mm-hmm. let's talk a little bit about that God, Joanne is, I know this kind of blew you away what is this crazy voodoo like I don't mm-hmm. I was I, I like it was so crazy to me like he has this thing and, and Lee's reaction when he sees it was like you know he sees that and he's like he's taken aback he's kind of breathless he's quiet you know that like where did you get that like he was so shocked to see it and where did he get it i i don't how did he get his hands on that it's literally impossible there's just there just doesn't seem to be possible you know and and i think it do we do we decide that it was he said he hadn't seen it in 40 years Mm -hmm. and this also gives us a little bit of an age nod for how old lee might be but he's he's T- really taken aback here and kind of stunned by what he's looking at. Something that I would assume he'd never thought he would see again. And here it is. And he just hands it to him. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, you know, I don't know. I don't have something like that in my life or, or my parents don't have something like that, that if it turned up out of nowhere, that I would be just so stunned by it. But I can imagine I could put myself in that position because he's a traveler and he, and he journeys and he adventures and he's probably, lost her early on or left her early on. And so he hasn't, she hasn't been around for a long time. And there's something so important about that object, but how did it bring him to Perry? And then how did Perry even get his, ugh, okay. Yeah. It's very David Lynchy. Very. It, it is. Know? Right. Yeah. So, um, the, this, you know, I guess we sort of buried the lead here, but one thing that's interesting about, John Perry in this scene is that he has himself a demon of his very own. Mm -hmm. Uh, So what we, what is revealed here and what Pullman is telling us is that if you spend time in this world, in Lyra's world, you get a demon. Your demon comes outside of your body. I I mean, how does that work? How, how, how does that happen? And how long does it take? You know, what is the process? Hmm. I, I feel like it's like those little, like, remember the little adipose 
and how they would just sort of like <laughs> grow the and little then they go fat pro- the little fat <laughs> yeah. things yeah. yeah maybe it's like the little adipose that's adorable if it happens like that that's adorable yeah i mean but i don't i don't know you know is it like you wake up and it's there you know and then it's how shocking would that like be a, a cat pops out of the side of you or like an <laughs> ermine i mean that would be a little disturbing um though conver- i also wonder conversely uh if you're traveling around to worlds where uh, demons are in- inside, does that mean you lose your demon? Is uh, Lyra has Over spent time. a lot of time. Yeah. yeah. Lyra has spent a lot of time in two different worlds that have um, where demons are interior. You know what? Let's, I don't even want to think about that. Yeah. Can you imagine absor- reabsorbing your demon and how traumatic that traumatic that would be. Yeah. No. Ugh. Didn't Dwight Schrute have a twin in the womb and then he re- he resorbed them? <laughs> and so he has the power of like his, his unborn. Okay. All right. Do you guys remember that? Anyway. I, I didn't watch The Office. Okay. Never, okay. Uh, so Lee doesn't take much convincing, but it's a complex mission that we're talking about here. We're finding a random person with a random knife that is in a world that is extraordinarily dangerous to to Lee and to John because of the specters. And they need to find this knife. They need to find the bearer. And we know, of course, that the bearer is also running around with Lyra, who is very important to Lee. It feels like there's so much full circleage happening here that if they came together, like, you know, everything would collapse into like a black hole. Uh, there's so many important people here that are sort of on a, on a crash course, maybe. I, I just thought it was neat that all the promises that uh, Lee made uh, John make to him already done. Already done. You've got to have the liar has to be under the protection of the knife. Check score. Yep. You know, got to get me to get me to this world We're on our way. Yep. You know, I mean, he's he's batting a thousand with promises. Yeah, he's doing well. He didn't even do anything yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so off on an adventure, these two guys go. Um, they hop in the. Well, they hop. This is what, of course, they go back. The you know, I sort of went a little bit in the out of order, but they head back down the river. They get on. The, they get Lee's balloon back, and that's when they leave and start heading, heading north. I like how easily, and this goes back to something we talked about, I think a couple of weeks ago, all of the heroes of this should, this, these, the series are really good liars. Mm-hmm. All of them are really good at lying. I mean, Lee busts out the ring and starts playing it like he's a spy for the magisterium. And he's mm-hmm. like, fill up my balloon and not just with air. I want food. I want water, hook it up and ballast, mm-hmm. do the whole thing. And they're like, okay, sir. I mean, okay. yeah. he, he he's just using his his strength. And then I mean, um, and then John, you know, has uh, survived by becoming an entirely different person. Mm-hmm. You know, the only two people, actually, the only person in this whole series who isn't a good liar is Lord Azrael. Yeah. The only main character in any case is Lord Azrael. Everybody else is super duplicitous. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's pretty true to his nature. Mm-hmm. Like from the start. Yeah. For sure. I mean, and his his big scheme has nothing to do with lies. What are you going to do? Kill God? What are you going to do? Build a giant fortress? Get a giant army? Go fight God? And that's his whole thing. Everybody else is relying entirely on... Uh, subterfuge and i think that's it's interesting that the heroes are uh are the liars is that what makes lord Azrael such a compelling presence to other people is or he shoots from the hip and sort of tells it like it is how many times have we heard that recently mm-hmm. uh but like that's the draw of him he's like a politician but i mean a poli- truthful politician which is kind of a stretch but a politician in the sense that you know he's speaking my language He's mm-hmm. saying what he means and he means what he says. And there's something attractive to that. Yeah. Especially if like the world is filled with so much deception already. Mm-hmm. Fascinating. So their adventure is, is well off and, uh, and, and running. And then we come up to 
our friends Will and Lyra and their predicament there in Chittagaze, they are, I'm really worried about Will and his wound. And it his perpetual bleeding. It's just not getting better. Yeah. Well, how long has it been? How long, long, is long enough that you would think some clotting would have happened by now? I mean, like I feel like it's been about 24 hours. Maybe more. 48 because they because they they spent some time in the in the hotel or the house yeah. or whatever beforehand, yeah. Before so so they you know it happens and then they're there. And so yeah, I mean 48 hours? He's maybe? not sitting still. He's not healing. He's running around. Mm-hmm. But they're they're redressing his bandage. You just feel like over time, and so if you're looking at your hand, and you're thinking about losing those two fingers, there's a lot of there's a lot of significant part of your hand here. <laughs> so I can I can kind of see that problem. I think it would at least slow down a little bit. But even at the end of this series of chapters, it's still just mm-hmm. gushing blood. And poor Will, I don't know how much blood does he have left at this point. And Lyra's making tor- tourniquets. Yeah. Like he's like tie it up, and and even though she ties it up or tries to fix it, you know she it's does like her best. It's like dragging. Little, yeah, yeah. It, it it will not it will not stop. No, it will not stop. So I'm and I'm really I'm really worried about him. Yeah, and and I don't think they would know about like cauterizing it. Like, would they even like would that even be a thing? In a movie, they would have done it already. They would have right. you know stuck it on like a a hot piece of iron out of a fire you know just to you know whatever but yeah, should, they're uh, the old guy back in the tower would have done it a hundred percent if he had time he would have said let's do this real quick yeah but it was like that was the last thing on his mind he had yeah. to teach him how to use it and that was all he could do will it not stop because it's like a magic blade just the perfect cut that's so perfect and so clean that it just leaves no- you know what i mean like the like body there's nothing that... hanging to reconnect <laughs> yeah you know, it's, it's, yeah, I, 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 I know that sort of towards the end of this chapter, we were hopefully on our way to healing this wound, but I was certainly worried most of this, most of this chapter, poor Will. Oh, well, yeah. Do they it's not know of swollen? stitches? Yeah. yeah. Oh God. Yeah. It's gross. It's all red and swollen and pussy and nasty. Do, the, do yeah. they not know about stitches? Does, is this a thing that they don't do on Lyra's world? Because I would think that Lyra would be right up in there. There's no skin to stitch. It's a perfect cut. There's yeah, no. There's nothing it, extra. It to cut all the stuff. skin off. It's just a. It's just raw meat. Nice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's a good bit. Thanks, Alaric. All right. So if 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 things weren't bad enough with his wound, um, our friends, the kids in Chittagaze, aren't aren't liking our our heroes here. Yeah, they're a little upset about two in particular are upset about their brother, certainly blaming Lyra and Will for what happened, but they want that knife real bad. The protection that the knife provides feels like it's so important that anyone would do anything to get it in this world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And these kids are. You know, this is a this is an angry mob, you know, right out of you know Frankenstein. You know, they're torches and guns and and pitchforks, and oh, they're yeah. coming for these kids, and they're going to take them down. You know, more than more than one of them are talking about killing them. And how many of them have guns? Or just shooting at they're them shooting randomly? At them? Yeah, where did yeah. they get guns? I mean, they are all following Gaston like down the <laughs> down the hill. It's <laughs> a kill. Here. It's a very much it a is. kill the beast kind of yeah. moment. It is. And, and, and what's crazy is that, like, what Lyra says earlier in that chapter is that, um, what, what, what's the girl's name again? Not Alexandra. Angelica. What's her name? Angelica. Angelica. She saw us earlier and she was too chicken. Like, she wasn't, she wasn't brave enough to come to us now. So she went and she, like, gathered this mob. Mm-hmm. And who knows what she said to them, probably riling them up about the cat. Mm-hmm. You know, like sure. kind of re rehashing, mm-hmm. like remember the cat. And now she did this, and then they're all just going. And you're right; it's like kill the beast. And I, I, I think it was this chapter, wasn't it, where Lyra said how she never liked, she never trusted Angelica anyway. Mm-hmm. Was that in this? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. She like, yeah, I didn't like her anyway. Never and he was liked like, you uh, yes, you did. And well, like, yes, you did. You totally <laughs> liked her. But the, you know, but the point is, is that we got to find a way out of here. But yeah, they, they are, they are hardcore. Um, I mean, they're climbing up 
right? Don't they like start to climb up? Yeah, oh, yeah. This is yeah. forty. These are this is forty feral kids that are you know incensed and rioting here, and they're mm -hmm. coming after our our heroes. Our heroes are going to make a run for it. They see a line of trees that's in the distance, but Will's not doing so great as we said before, and he's not so mobile, and he doesn't have a lot of energy, and they can't just dart from place to place as maybe he would have before this entry but they don't make it to the trees they're not gonna make it to the trees you know at one point they turn back and and look back at the the house that they were in and there's kids that are like in the upper floors already looking at them from the windows and they know they're not going to make it to the tree line which was sort of a place that they might feel a little safer uh -huh. and they see a tower uh, a sort of tower with statues and you know and not necessarily the tower the same kind of tower that was in town but a, a different kind of tower like almost, almost like an observation tower mm -hmm. and they make a run for that instead you know you gotta think about about these kids for a second i mean they're not just feral i mean these are kids who know that this knife is all that stands between their parents and a slow death at the hands of the specters, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, they're doing whatever they can to protect, not just themselves, but the, the adults in their lives they are trying to get a little bit of this knife means stability for them. Mm -hmm. So it really, it really makes a lot of sense for them to be this angry over, uh, the knife. Cause I, I'm sure, um, you know, whatever the, the older brother's name was, I, I don't think that him getting attacked by the specters was going to be a uh, a turning point for these kids, like the 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 symbolism of this knife. Right, like it, it's more than Lord of the Flies here. Mm -hmm. Like it's more than just oh somehow we lost all you know semblance of civilization and we just totally you know lose it. Like there's a desperation there, but I think part of the anger too comes from the fact that Lyra is not from that world. And they make so many points to say, you're not from here and you're, you're not one of us and you don't know this and you know that. So that sh because they're the ones that take it, there's, there's like an extra, mm -hmm. you know, venomous, you know, feeling towards it because it's mm -hmm. like you of all people are going to be the one, like you have, you don't know what it is, you don't know what it does and why do you have it? Yeah. So I, I think yeah. that's you can kind of, I, you, you almost sympathize with that. You know, that that's a, that's a sympathetic argument. They, they their whole lives generations and generations and generations of people in this world have been dealing with this and the one thing that can protect them the one thing that they can defend themselves with is is now in the hands of some fool from you know london you know yeah. our london not even they don't even know where they're from yeah they know yeah, they're in, different in the, the audiobook the kids all have uh, italian accents ah interesting and uh you know lyra and will are extremely english so it's um you you get just in in the audio, a, a clear demarcation between the the two sets of kids. Mm -hmm. But these guys are like, they go into that tower, mm -hmm. and they are right behind them. Mm -hmm. Like they are right behind. So they're they're on their tail. This was a this was a kind of chase that in another one of these chase sequences we've had several in this book, uh, where you know you're sort of like getting. I was reading it on the train, and I had you know I was getting the my nerves were shot. <laughs> I was like, what are they going to do? You know, all Will wants to do is cut a hole and jump through. You know, they, that's really sort of the, the plan here, right? right? They need to find a place where you can cut a hole, they'll step through, and they'll and they'll be fine. But he's like, well, we can't just cut it through. I could cut through and we'll be in the middle of the street. Like, we, I need to, like, look around a little bit. Mm -hmm. And they just don't have time to do that. And then getting into this tower, Travis, you brought this up last week. They get to the top of the tower. They have a hot second. He cuts a... A hole in what does he find <laughs> nothing but air yep Whoops. in the middle of the air <laughs> oh oh we're 50 feet in the air that's not is there a pool down there <laughs> i forgot we went up a hill you would see a trampoline somewhere does that world have trampolines <laughs> i just so imagined that... this wily coyote uh moment yeah exactly uh so that didn't work out so well and these kids are setting upon them pretty quickly and they are kind of trapped will and liar they got nowhere to go pan is kind of she pan is kind of upset too in this the pan is a, right. freaking out yeah right 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 
And be, and when the when the kids start to get closer and closer and closer and they don't know what to do, Will takes the knife and he like slashes the oh staircase. God. He cuts the staircase down. He cuts the st- and the staircase like falls on some kids. Like I'm getting all excited. It falls on the kids and they're getting like crushed. <laughs> And they're like, oh, you know, yeah, screw those like, kids. Oh, they're like yelling, like you can't. It is insane. Yeah, yeah. that was that maybe one insane. of those things where you saw the power of the knife, not the mystical power, but just sort of the sharpness power of it, you know, and how much it can accomplish just in its sort of basest form. The which Home is Depot like, power. He, yeah, he could, yeah, exactly. He could just cut through anything. Mm-hmm. It's pretty astonishing. That buys them a little bit of time, but not so much. I mean, the kids are clambering up the outside of the tower oh, at this yeah. point. Uh, but luckily, the star of Untitled Goose Game arrives and uh, takes care of business, right? Who shows up to save them? Serafina Pecola and the witches. Oh, so great to see them. This, this, You know, the, their crossing paths was bound to happen at some point, and the fact that it happens at this very moment, you know, Serafina kind of this is a, this is her this is her thing you know she likes to roll up at the last second and mm-hmm. and save the day you know she's done it twice already mm-hmm. uh, and Lyra is real happy to see her you know they they the the group of witches is like thwip thwip thwipping arrows at these kids and the kids essentially break from the mob almost immediately they're so oh, yeah. kind of terrified that pulls uh, them right back into being children like yeah, they, they run they away are with terrified their. Sh- yep, they sort of run away with. Uh, P- P- Pullman mentions, you know, they run away with their shame. You know, that they're mm-hmm. they're yeah. almost shameful for what they were doing. I mean, and that's exactly that's exactly Lord of the Flies. Spoilers for somebody who hasn't read it, I guess, at this point. But that's exactly what happens. Is Jeez. at some point they run into that an, an adult figure, and I think that's why it was an yep. adult figure. And just like at the end of Lord of the Flies, when they're on the beach and they're ready to come and get Ralph. And they see this officer and they all they just turn right back to, to kids, you know, mm-hmm. and they're and, and he thinks they're playing a game. And that's what happens here. They see Serafina. She's an adult. And they just somehow like remember what they're doing is wrong. And they slink away shame faced, like hot faced and, and full of shame. It's, it was interesting. And Lyra's like, Serafina, Serafina, come down. And, and they're just circling overhead. And they're like, ah, ah, ah. Oh, no, we're, <laughs> yeah. we're not coming down there. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but they do yeah. realize that Will and Lyra are surrounded by specters. They can see specters surrounding this tower, hundred at least of them, but they're not approaching. And Serafina does uh, it's revealed that they have lost a witch already to the specters. Mm-hmm. They have lost a witch since we saw them last. But Serafina lands. And talks to them. She realizes that she can. She's not, I wouldn't say safe, but she knows that they're not approaching this knife. They're terrified of this knife or will or both. Yeah. Well, go ahead. Oh, no, 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 go ahead. Oh, okay. So I I think it's interesting because she sends Kesa down first, not knowing yet that the specters are somehow adverse to or repelled by the knife. And so, you know, one of my questions is, can they, can they, do they have to grab the human part? Do the specters have to feed on the human part? And they, like, was Kesa in any danger? That, that's a really good point, because I thought the specters ate the equivalent of the demon from the other people. Right. So why would she send her demon right into the mix? Would you, it, since the, the human is so important, like when you kill the demon, the human form still exists and we've seen now that there are sort of like zombie versions of people so the people can still sort of exist as like a husk of themselves without their demon so the the human is so important to being stripped of their demon that perhaps in order to take the demon the specters have to feast on the human part of it in order to take it possibly like they have to break that bond Somehow, the, at the, yeah, human, the, at the, the human. demons, the demons don't seem to have the same kind of form that people do. Yeah, you know, they, you know, they, they don't touch. You know, they don't touch people very often. You know, it's there's definitely some there's something different about them. Like there's almost like a um, a tether or an umbilical attached to the person, not to the demon. And you've got and they kind of go after that. Yeah, hmm. yeah, 
this may prove the point because you're right case is sort of like there and talking to them and says oh the witches can't can't come down but i'm down here talking to you doesn't seem he doesn't seem too worried about Mm -hmm. it but maybe he's just looking around and making sure that in i assume he can see the demons or Mm -hmm. he can see the specters uh but you know seraphina comes down anyway she sort of notices that they're not approaching and there there's something going on and uh well will is very stricken by seeing the witches and especially Serafina up close. You know, she's, she's something to behold apparently. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. I hope at some point we get some kind of explanation for the witches. Um, I, I'm really interested in where they diverge from the rest of like baseline humanity. Like we, we know that they've got different powers. They're, they're much longer lived. Their demons can fly further away. Mm Mm-hmm. I'd, I'm really interested to know, and, and it's genetic. It's passed along genetically along the maternal line. Mm-hmm. So I'm really interested to know how they happen. Right. Yeah. Is it something, you know, how did they start? How did they begin? Right. What is their origin? Yeah. I don't necessarily need to know the origin of everything, but the the witches in particular are such a an interesting piece of this this mythology. Mm-hmm. And maybe it's not addressed in this trilogy, but maybe he's addressing it in, in these subsequent books that he's talk he's writing. You know, I'd, yeah. I'd be interested in some of that stuff. You're yeah. absolutely right. So um, Serafina speaks to them and is is fascinated by the knife, of course. But she says, "Hey, you know, thirty minute thirty minutes from here, there's a cave. We'll meet you there." And uh, it's not thirty minutes for Will, who was really dragging here. It takes them almost two hours to get there. Uh, but they get there. There's a meal waiting for them. Um, Lyra is elated to see the witches, of course. And uh, Serafina sets on helping Will and fixing his wound. And she knows that any kind of standard elixir that she might make is not going to work. They got to make a spell. And uh, they get, feed him some, some nasty concoction that they sweetened with honey. And Will passes out legit straight away. Yeah. And uh, was there more to that chapter after that? Well, and then and then Serafina just asks Lyra, "Oh yeah, tell me about tell me about Will." Oh yeah. See, I think this is really interesting because a little earlier back, I mean, Will is fascinated by by the witches, and again, not because they can fly, but because of their he calls it a their fierce, cold, lovely clarity of her gaze. Like there's something ethereal and different about her and he can recognize that but I found it really interesting that when Kesa when Kesa was telling Will to because Serafina wasn't there yet so when Kesa was telling Will to go like you can't see these specters we'll go down the slope it's like 10 paces down Will takes out his knife the knife and Kesa it says he hisses in surprise so there's something about the knife that Kesa could sense I mean, do you, do you, this is sense? that thing you were talking about that it could, it can cut through the link between demon and and human too. Yeah, if you're not careful. So was it? Could it sense that? That's what I mean. Like, could he sense that that was happening and that was why he hissed? Probably. Maybe the witches Probably. don't seem. The witches aren't afraid of. I mean, he hands it to them. They hold it. You know, mm-hmm. it's so they're they're not afraid of it. But yeah, you're right. Kesa must sense something. There's a there's something about it that is striking and and I don't know dangerous. I don't know. I, I think maybe there's a difference between you know putting a weapon in the hand of someone who knows how to use it and giving it to an 11 year old. <laughs> yeah. You know, a goose sees a, a gun in the hand of an 11 year old, freaked out a little bit. Give it give it to the the witches who are experienced with uh, powerful you know what magic. It's cool. Right. But here we are. Lyra and Will both have incredibly powerful instruments Mm -hmm. in their possession. Now, Mm -hmm. the the focus of of these powerful interdimensional tools are in the hands of two kids. And I think what I love about this part then, too, is that Serafina, she's asking Lyra to tell her about it because she has no idea. Right. Like, you know, for having been around as long as she has and as long as witches have... She's like, tell me about this boy and tell me about this knife because they've never, they have no idea what it is. Right. Which is a big deal, I think. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. 
a lot like the um, situation with uh, the other witch, whose name is escaping me right now. Um, the big magic, the 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 one with the angels. Yes. You know, and and how they they recognize that she's young, despite the fact you know she's like four hundred years old. I think this whole situation right now is kind of we're we're in uncharted territory for everyone, no matter how old they are. Right. 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 So um, we move on from that chapter. God, these chapters are so dense. There's so much so going much. on. So much. <laughs> so we're back into um, Mary Malone's world. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, our world, I guess. Uh, and she is meeting with her co-worker or uh, the researcher she's working with on this project yeah uh, dr Payne, dr Payne in the butt in my opinion <laughs> um who is a total buzzkill i'm not not a fan uh he's so he initially says very early on in the conversation when she's sort of talking about continuing the research he says oh i've taken another job right he's like going to geneva mm-hmm. i'm leaving you know good luck right but in the midst of this, when she's like, okay, I guess, and she's trying to think about what she's going to do, um, Sir Charles rolls up. Lord Boreal shows up. Um, and he wants to meet with them, and he says that he is going to put in a good word for them to maybe help them get the funding that they need. But there are strings attached. What kind of strings are we talking about here, guys? Not good. It's um, it's wild because it kind of it 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 gets gradually more it gradually weirder. <laughs> the first one's like, hey, okay, fine, no big deal. I got yeah. you. Yeah, uh, just do some of this research. All right, fine. You know, uh, you know, find this kid. What? <laughs> you know? it, it, it sort of like steadily gets worse and worse, and it's like, yeah. how, what? And it yeah, sucks because she has revealed so much to Dr. Payne and I'm sort of like listening to this conversation. I'm like, Oh God, is this guy going to give up the whole, like, what is he going to tell him? Is he going to keep his mouth shut? Right. Because up until this point, she was trying to convince him to stay on. Yes. She's like, if you go, we're totally shut down. They're not good. Like, and then, so that's why she was trying to tell him all of these things that she had gotten or, or knew that Lyra knew, trying to show him like she knew these things, and and we, you know, nobody told her about it. It's it's real. And then you know, Boreal shows up, and he pulls the same kind of crap that he pulls with like Lyra and Will. Like, well, don't try to take the alethiometer from me because I'll have I'll have papers that say I own that in like a hot second. So, do you know what I mean? So he yeah, he says that. he says she has this you know, compass is fine. Compass made of gold and um, obviously stolen, you know, and then like obviously. continues on, mm-hmm. to, you know, it's like oh, this guy, he's persuasive, you know, he's very persuasive because obviously Dr. Payne is very taken with him. Um, maybe it's his a- apparent wealth, uh, his stature, the sir, is he even a sir, you know, right. um, that's something that really weighs heavily on this conversation. And you can see that Mary's, pretty much over it it's towards the end of his pitch is like, you know, get this guy out of here. But it's clear that Dr. Payne is more on board. You know, he's so Charles is about to leave because Mary uh-huh. kind of shuts him down mm-hmm. and, and Dr. Payne's like, no, 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 oh, oh, Mary. Oh, no, no, no. He sort of like is, I don't know, demeaning to her a little bit. And, 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 sort of steps up and, and and then he's like maybe not going to take this other job and he, he changes his whole tune and uh, he's like I, nothing signed nothing signed I mean t- tell me this guy isn't riding her coattails mm-hmm. there's no way totally. he's come up with any of this stuff totally and he doesn't have a job he offer, got nothing. for one second Geneva no you know how way. expensive it is to live in Geneva you gotta have a good job to move there He's trying to like puff himself up to look because he's leaving with his tail between his legs because he's got nothing. Right. Mm-hmm. He's lying to her. So Mary, you know, raises both middle fingers essentially and leaves. And she ain't two seconds out of that door before Dr. Payne. I love the way this was written, but Dr. Payne picks up that card and, and calls Sir Charles immediately. Yes. He turncoats immediately. 
It's he sees dollar signs. Oh, of course he, he does. sees dollar signs. Oh. oh, I'm sorry. Real quick, the 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 list. So it starts with mind manipulation. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> then it goes to the many worlds theories. <laughs> and then this kid, you got to find this kid. And the it's many so... worlds, the thing attached to the many worlds, he's like, oh, defense contractors would be interested in that. Yeah. It's like, how is that a selling point? And like, oh, we can, <laughs> there's not much red tape with them. I don't know. With my job, it would be a selling point. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. So Mary Bolts. Dr. Payne calls up Sir Charles. So we know the, the wheels are rolling a little bit here with uh, you know, the deck is getting stacked against our heroes. Um, and Lord Boreal is moving in and getting closer and closer. But she has sort of a plan here. She, mm-hmm. she comes back to the lab at midnight. And when she gets back, there is a quote unquote security guard that she's never seen. The only security they have is literally a door lock and an elderly, you know, porter, I think she says. Yep. So she goes back and there's some men in black kind of character mm-hmm. there that she shows her magnetic badge and he ultimately lets her in and she says she's checking on some computer program that's running. He buys it. Again, deception seems to she's pretty good at it. Mm-hmm. Uh she goes into the lab and Kind of some astonishing things happen. She does some astonishing things. The computer turns into Hell 9000 <laughs> and starts talking to her. She connects to it. Mm-hmm. She she starts to ask questions, and it's in a completely different format than she used she's used to. Mm-hmm. And this this intelligence on the other end is answering her every question. Yeah. Right. But I, but I love how in the beginning when she first tries to connect with it, her lack of confidence affects the, her ability to do that. And the first thing she says is, hello, I'm not sure what I'm doing. Maybe this is crazy. And there's like nothing. Like she doesn't get any response. And then she relaxes and she tries again. And then she was like, I'm trying to do with words what I've seen this thing. And then it, and then it responds to her, ask a question. Mm-hmm. And so then she asks question after question after question, and we get the same, you know, pithy, pithy responses. Yes, no, exactly, like very, very quick. Yeah, the uh, the audiobook was was really cool because um, there's this line here. The answers lash themselves right across the screen almost before she had finished. So the way it's performed, it's are you shadows? Yes. Are you the same as Lyra's dust? Yes. And is that dark map before? The and she even fully answers asks the question. The answer's there, you know. No, she it knows she's you know. Are, are you the same? Is this the same as Lyra's does? Yes. There's it, it sort of it knows what she's going to ask before mm-hmm. she asks it. Mm-hmm. But then they identify themselves as something very specific. Yeah. Angels. Yep. Angels. And what? this architectural angel mm-hmm. comes into play again. Travis, your favorite. Mm-hmm. They identify themselves as that. Yep. And so now I'm wondering, are the, is dust just, you know, microscopic angels or, or, or very tiny angels? What, what How many angels say? can says, dance on the head of a pin? Right. It's just oh like, my is, Lord. It, is this intelligent and, and are, are you intelligent? Like apparently. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and sarcastic. So. So sarcastic. <laughs> and that sort of reminds me of the alethiometer where it's like, uh, you know, it's a dream about a head, you know, it's, it's like, uh, the way that it describes things, this intelligence, you know, the angels, mm-hmm. is 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 very matter of fact and and amusing in some ways sometimes. Mm-hmm. But yeah, uh, are there more than one of you? Un- uncountable billions. Oh yeah. Ah, ah, love it. And what are they? And how do they exist? And how are they communicating? And 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 how are they in every universe or every world at the same time? Mm-hmm. And how are they? What is their play in this? Why are they helping our heroes? And not just our heroes, but humanity. Humanity. It's like the beginning. They inter- they intervened in evolution. They made us what I'm I'm jumping to conclusions here, but they made us self-aware. Like yes. that's what I'm getting from this. 35,000 like, years ago, we went from just, you know, animals. Animals, you know, and then the monolith shows up. And we touch it, and all of a sudden we have consciousness. It's yep. amazing. Yep. 
And the reason they said was vengeance. I love that. It's right. like, did you, you know, why did you, you intervened? Yes. Why? Vengeance. That, that, made, that made the short hairs on my neck stand up. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Because I'm like, oh boy, this is, this is getting deep. Uh-huh. Vengeance for what and against whom? Yeah. I assume um, we'll find out. And then we find out that it's got Google Maps built in. <laughs> <laughs> it does. Go to so, Sunderland Avenue. It answers, it answers basically everything that she asked up to a point. And then it's like, no more questions. You got to right. go. I'm telling you what to do. The, do this, this, and this. Mm-hmm. And she's like, well, she's like, just do it. And now. Yeah. Not tomorrow. Not in a week. Now. And you are not supposed to be here anymore. Destroy this. Your work here is done. Can you imagine yeah. just taking this information off a computer screen and just like, okay, I guess I'm going to pack a knapsack and bowl. I mean, you know, can you imagine doing that? Well, I mean, he's, it says to her, you've been preparing for this your entire life. Like this year doesn't, this isn't, this doesn't even matter anymore. Mm-hmm. Like you can like destroy it. We can't let it get into the hands of like these bad people. You mm-hmm. don't what what you have here you don't need anymore because mm-hmm. you're like you're you're to the next level like you mm-hmm. move, you know like it, this is pointless we just yeah. can't let anybody else get it right um, it reminds me of that line from Blade where uh, he says you know that world you you know has been the sugar coated topping you know the, now you're getting into the real meat of everything right, right. this right. is this was this was neat so she does she. She destroys everything that she can destroy. She burns up plans. She stomps on floppy disks. And, and mm-hmm. you know, she destroys what she thinks she needs to destroy, knowing that we clearly know at this point that she's the brains behind this operation. So whatever she does away with, she form, reformats the hard drive. You know, she does everything she can before she leaves. And you know, she, she leaves with relative ease. She just walks past the dude, and it's not a big deal. You know, she even lit something on fire, you know, but she still made it out and is heading to this Sunderland Avenue location where there is a tent. You know, the the angels tell her that she needs to deceive. She needs to be the serpent. Yeah. Which I love. And she is going to make her way to this position, deceive the guardian. And then proceed inside the tent. Mm-hmm. And she gets there, and sure enough, there's one guardian inside a you know Con Ed truck or something. It, it's a it's a it's a unmarked van for the most part, isn't it? Yeah. And he hops out, and and he even what's funny is he's even on the lookout for Mary Malone. This is how dim witted this guy <laughs> right. is. I know. He's right. looking for. He was like, oh yeah, I was actually looking for a woman, but oh now that I'm looking at your your crappy ID that you made five minutes ago. Uh, Clearly, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, poor Al. He just wanted some like extra shifts. Like he was, he was just trying, you know. Instead of Oliver Payne, she's Olivia Payne. Olivia Payne. <laughs> <laughs> it's the lamest like attempt to 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 see. Like it was so. Oh, no. It's just Olive. Like she yeah. just scratched off. Oh yeah, the it's arm. just Olive. Yeah, just scratched, <laughs> that's right. It's o- Olive. That's right. Scratches off. So oh, she, man. he. He grants her access. She has no idea what's going to be behind this thing. Either she was even thinking, you know, he didn't even know what was behind it. It was going to be what a dead body or, you know, whatever. But he just knew that, you know, it was the access was quite limited. So once she gets access, she walks through and she finds one of these tremendous and exciting open rectangles into Chittagaze, a city by the sea. There you go. And walks right through it without breaking a sweat. Yeah, I love Mary. Oh, no, Mary's awesome. Or Mary. Mary's cool. I want to be Mary when I grow up. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, any other notes on these chapters before we talk about what's coming in the next couple weeks? One tiny thing. Shoot. I'll make it short. Can I just tell you that the the guy calling Jopari? It was like the Gobblers, John Parry. Japari, the goblin, <gasps> the general ablation board. And I felt oh my like, God. I was like, that's the second time in this series I'm going to yell that it gets like, duh, Joanna. Like, it was the most obvious reveal. I was like, you're an idiot. Uh, I cannot I believe like, that. Like, dipstick. A I dip- cannot uh, believe that. 
Uh, and then I just kept saying it over and over. And I was like, you, like, Jopari, jo- John Parry, Jopari. Oh, my God. Hodor. <laughs> <laughs> I just had to get that off my chest because it was bugging me since we talked about Lee. And I didn't get a chance to interject it. And- oh, man, that's great. Wow. That's great. Well, thank you for interjecting that. We got <laughs> to post about that. I'm mind blown. So we're heading into the next couple of weeks, and they're going to be very exciting weeks because we're going to finish this book next week. We've got uh, chapters 13, 14, 15, the final three chapters of The Subtle mm-hmm. Knife. So this is obviously going to be quite a quite a ride. And we'll talk about that next week. But we also have in the UK, Sunday the 3rd of November, uh, the premiere of the new show on BBC. And on Monday, Monday, HBO is going to show the show here in the states at uh on the on the fourth on monday so yeah. we what our plan is we're going to do our final episode on the subtle knife and then we're going to spend a bunch of weeks talking about the show uh, we're going to do some some cold reactions shortly after the show drops and then subsequent weeks we'll talk more about the preceding episode and hot takes on the new episode uh, but we're we're i can't believe it's one week away doesn't it seem like it, well, we, if, it feels like we've been doing this podcast for a while, right? but I remember looking at your original breakdown about how we would do this in order to finish the subtle knife by the time, and we're actually going to do it, even with a week off, yes. right? It's pretty cool. I'm pretty excited we pulled it off. Planning! <laughs> <laughs> so uh, please, please check out our website. Um, we're going to update some things on there soon uh, at theamberspycast.com. We'd love to hear your feedback at feedback at theamberspycast.com as well. Check us out on Instagram and Facebook. We'd love to hear from you, any comments. Uh, but please do listen, like, subscribe. Check us out on YouTube, our YouTube channel, where you can see our lovely and smiling faces. And uh, yeah, yeah, here we are. And, uh, and hear more about what you guys think of this amazing series. All. all right bye everybody talk to bye you soon. everybody good night see you next week yeah oh did he just leave yeah he just like hung up wow whoa it says it still says it's recording the call yes it does it she's still he he's still recording the call and yet <laughs> he's not on that's so weird that's creepy right i've never Oh, now he's back. Oh, there he is. Sorry, I didn't mean, I didn't mean, didn't mean to do that. <laughs> it was crazy because, like, he left, but it said you were still recording the call. So it's like you were sitting here just, like, recording us. I know. I just, yeah. I, 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 I. <laughs>